My son is gonna live a life without limits. I know my family can't give him sight, but they can damn sure give him that. It's Pearson Family Fun Time, so let's dive into the first two episodes of season four of This Is Us and find out just what happened. <laughs> What's going on, you lovely people? Lisa here, and it is time to get back to rambling all about This Is Us. That's right, Fall TV is back. And first, I just want to apologize for missing the premiere episode. As you can see, I've been busy working on my filming space, still not quite done, and also working on a few other projects um, that have proven to take up more time than I originally thought. So I'm a little behind on things, which is actually kind of typical for me, I feel like. I apologize for that, but I know that Fall TV is back, so I'm going to do my best to get on a timely routine. But alas, This Is Us is back, and I am so ready to dive back into the Pearson family story, and of course, uh, stare at Milo Ventimiglia. Like, that's not, a, that's not a bad thing, right? Now, the first episode in Season 4, we are introduced to three new characters, which meant limited Pearson time, which I know had fans divided. But the second episode, we were all back to our Pearson family. So let's go ahead and break down both of these episodes, and I'll try to go through the first episode quickly. So the premiere episode is all about strangers and how they can come into your lives and change it for better or worse, as we hear Rebecca tell Jack as they return from their cross-country road trip. It's actually kind of terrifying, you know, how a single cross with one person you've never met can change everything. Rebecca then invites Jack to meet her parents at a country club, and yeah, talk about intimidating. Like, what is this, the third or fourth date or something? Like, they're moving kind of fast. Granted, they've already traveled the uh, country together, so maybe it's not as fast as uh, we would think. But meeting the parents, no matter what, for the first time is always nerve-wracking, and you can see Jack with the nerves because he has to get a sports coat in order to go to this country club. So he goes to the store, and this is where he meets a stranger that will definitely be in his life forever, none other than Miguel. Yes, we get the meet cute of Jack and Miguel, as Jack realizes he can't really afford this sports coat, and Miguel is right there to help him out, telling him to do, I think what a lot of us are guilty of, buy it, keep the tag on it, return it later, and get a refund. So Jack goes to meet Rebecca's parents, and we've already met her racist mother in past episodes, but here we get to meet her dad for the first time, and it's evident that Rebecca and her dad are very close. She is a daddy's girl. Now, Rebecca warns her parents before dinner to not bring up the Vietnam War in front of Jack, but of course, it's all they choose to talk about, and Jack's pretty nervous and ends up spilling food on his sports coat. He goes away to clean it and comes back regrouped and ends up sharing part of his story about the brother he lost and by lost we know that his brother's not dead but in ways is dead to him and how this war is very real and real lives have been lost contrary to what her parents may think about this war now jack taking a stand actually impresses rebecca's father and he even slyly lets jack know that the tag of the sports coat is showing as to not embarrass Jack in front of everybody. So it's kind of like, oh, cool, Jack and Rebecca's dad are going to get along. He seems pretty cool. Well, I was obviously wrong. As they're leaving, Rebecca's dad pulls Jack aside, saying that Jack seems like a nice guy, but he knows Jack is hiding a lot of demons and that Rebecca deserves the best. And basically, her dad says he'll do whatever he can to split up Jack and Rebecca. I was rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. Look, if I did not know how this love story of Jack and Rebecca ended, I would be so pissed off, but now I'm just kind of excited to see what exactly Jack does to win over uh, Rebecca's dad, or if he even wins him over in the first place. Maybe Rebecca just rebels and chooses Jack over her dad. That'll be kind of fun to see play out. Now, the other strangers we meet are in the present, or so we think at first. We meet a teenage boy named Malik and his supportive parents who are yet another couple on the show who are couple goals. Seriously. How many are there gonna be? We end up learning that Malik is a teenage father who has a baby daughter who he is in love with and just wants the best for. I mean, this kid spends his time watching the baby on the baby monitor instead of playing hoops with his friends. Now, he's making money working at his dad's body shop, but he realizes how expensive having a kid is going to be, and he is tempted to partake in some not so legal side business in order to earn money to raise her. Thankfully, his dad is observant and knows the guy that Malik was talking to is bad news. So Malik's dad pulls him aside to give him the talk about how 
he himself almost went down that dark path, but then he had Malik and knew he had to, you know, clean up his act. Because of that, Malik's parents want Malik to be able to feel like a normal kid too, so Malik's dad offers to babysit so Malik can go to a friend's barbecue that he originally was told that he couldn't go to. There we see Malik cooking up some burgers and he's introduced to a new girl in town who happens to be Deja, who returns home with the biggest smile on her face. What's happening with your face? What? Um... Nothing. Yeah, get ready for some puppy love, guys. So our next new character is Cassidy Sharp, a soldier overseas who ends up seeing a mission go not the way they wanted it to, and many lives are lost, and she comes back suffering from PTSD and turns to alcohol to cope with everything. This puts a strain on her relationship with her husband and her young son, and she ends up triggered one day when she hears her husband talking about the price of fixing the water heater, which matches the cost of the money that they gave to each citizen in that village in order to pay for the lives lost. Cassidy ends up zoning out and when her son tries to get her attention, she pulls her arm away and ends up hitting her son, causing her husband to kick her out of the house. Cassidy then goes to the VA center for help and goes to group and shares her story and then all of a sudden, a chair comes flying through the window out of nowhere and standing outside is a drunk Uncle Nicky in the present day. So we then see Kevin in California getting a call about Nicky's behavior as he's listed Kevin as his his emergency contact and uh, well Kevin wires Nikki money for bail and it looks like Kevin may be about to book a plane ticket to Pittsburgh which means that while Malik's family ends up interacting with Randall and his family in Philly in the present Cassidy will have a tie to Nikki and Kevin's storyline in the present and even though right now it seems like she's just separated from her husband could she end up being Kevin's baby mama in the future storyline we saw at the end of last season Time will tell, right? But get those theories started. The last new character we meet in this season premiere, we meet in kind of Jack Pearson style, ass first. It's a young man who's naked in bed, hung over, and when he sits down for breakfast and tries to share his food with his adorable little dog, the plate falls and we end up learning that this man is blind. Now the seemingly unfortunate event of a broken plate leads him to his local cafe, which he's actually never been to for breakfast, so he's never met this waitress named Lucy before. Now, we see that this ends up being a good thing, as this kid is witty and confident, and also a singer-songwriter, and he manages to win over Lucy. They hit it off, and after meeting, the guy goes home and writes a song, which ends up becoming a hit song. We then fast forward through their relationship as we see them date, get engaged, and it's kind of cute how they have that broken uh, plate framed and on the wall. We then see that they get married, and right before this guy's big concert, before going into the venue, Lucy, who has just opened up a restaurant and is kind of stressed, reveals she's pregnant and scared, and we see this guy comfort her, telling her everything will be okay. He then walks on stage, and we learn this young man's true identity. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Daniel. That's right, he is a grown-up baby Jack Damon, Kate and Toby's son. And then we see concurrently in flashbacks that Kate and Toby learn their son will be blind. And, and Toby tells Kate that it doesn't matter because this boy will get the best of both of them. And we see that in the future, Jack ends up getting Toby's confidence and wit and the singing abilities of Kate. So, you know what? Kate and Rebecca had these dreams of being a famous singer and it seems like they finally came true through Jack. So now we just kind of got to theorize and wonder if Jack and Lucy are the they that Toby calls in that future storyline to head to the way uh, to head to Kevin's house or if it's maybe Jack and Kate. We still don't really have any references to future Kate. So we're waiting on that one. Also, just a really random theory to try to interconnect all these stories again. We see that Malik in the present has a knack for cooking. Maybe in the future, we have Jack and Lucy opening up that restaurant. Could Malik possibly be a chef there? I mean, that would be kind of cool. But yeah, so that's what happened in the season four premiere. So let's go ahead and keep chugging through and talk about episode two, the pool part. Too. So this episode deals with the last day of summer, our grown-up Pearsons wanting to hold badly onto their kids who are changing, and they just want that last 
family fun day, free of puberty and growing pains. But of course that doesn't happen. So in our flashback, Jack wants to do something fun for the last day of summer and tells the family they're going to the pool for a pool day, but of course all three kids are not interested. Now as soon as they get to the pool, the kids scatter to hang out with their friends, leaving Jack and Rebecca to reminisce about the good old days when the kids loved actually hanging out with them and the only problem they faced was trying to make the kids wear the pool floaties. Now for Kate, two popular girls ask her to hang out with them, which Rebecca immediately sees as a not a good thing. But of course Kate's like, leave me alone mom, gosh it's so embarrassing. Well it actually turns out that Rebecca was right and these girls are unfortunately messing with Kate and they tell her that this cute popular guy wants to kiss her behind the snack shack and to go wait for him. So Kate goes back there and that guy does not end up showing up. Instead it's a nerdy acne ridden boy named Cliff who they told uh, Kate was waiting for and she wanted to kiss him. Well, he's now embarrassed, and since Kate was expecting someone else, they decide to con just kind of, you know, stand there for a few minutes to give off the illusion that something happened. Kate then decides she's not going to let these girls win, and you know what? She's not going to let Cliff be embarrassed, so she gives him a kiss anyway. As far as Kevin and Randall, preteen Kevin still is proving he's, like, freaking the worst. Kevin ends up bonding with Randall's friends over rap music, in particular the song of Rump Shaker, rapping a verse, and then calling out Randall to rap the next part, knowing good and well Randall does not. Not know the words. This causes Randall to suffer from extreme embarrassment as Randall's friends say that Kevin is blacker than him and call Randall an Oreo. This leads Randall to retaliate by ruining Kevin's cassette tape and you know if you lived in that time period and had, had cassette tapes that any time that tape got stretched out and messed up it was the freaking worst. So of course this leads Kevin and Randall to having a shoving match which Jack comes to try to break up and the boys of course lie saying nothing really is going on, it's just horseplay. Randall however tells Kevin that he was embarrassed by him and it's like all that Kevin seems to want to do and he does it on purpose and Kevin is supposed to be his brother so Randall's super hurt by this. It seems though that this talk finally gets through to Kevin. He sits down and thinks and asks Jack if he's a good person. Now Jack says Kevin is, but then Kevin's kind of like, well, why? Because he's done so many bad things. And it's kind of like, finally, Kevin, you're realizing you're a little dick. Well, Jack ends up telling Kevin that they're more complicated than they think. And these Pearson men, they got a lot of, you know, mixed up things inside that they got to wrestle with. And we do see Kevin wrestle with that in the present day as well. Eventually, all three kids do come back to sit with Jack and Rebecca as Jack reminisces about the past years when the five of them all cuddled on the pool chair. And it was simpler times. And it seems like maybe Jack is starting to miss that. Now moving on to our present day. Randall, Beth, and the girls are adjusting to life in Philly. Randall, just like Jack, wants one last family fun day before the girls start school. But the girls, of course, have other plans. Tess wants to go to the salon to cut her hair, and Deja wants to take Randall on the bus route to school to prove that she can do the bus alone. And of course, she thinks Randall's being ridiculous since she's grown up taking care of herself since she was like eight and has been riding the bus alone since then. Then we have good old Annie, who just doesn't have a care in the world. Annie, my favorite child, is there anything that you'd like to do today? I'm good with whatever. Bless your soul. So they split up and make plans to meet up later. Tess, Annie, and Beth go to the salon where Tess shows the stylist what she wants done to her hair, and Beth is pretty worried that it's too drastic of a change. She doesn't want her little girl growing up, it seems like. Meanwhile, Deja makes Randall sit quite a few rows behind her on the bus to simulate her actually riding the bus alone. But when a man sits down next to Deja and starts talking her ear off, Randall freaks out and makes that man switch her seats. They then meet up with the rest of the family outside the salon and Randall and Beth compare notes and essentially they're the same. <laughs> Nothing went well for either of them and the girls are pretty bad at them. Tess then comes out of the salon showing off her short haircut and Beth says she loves it but you can see that she's not fully on board with it. She looks a little concerned still. The family then go to finish out their family fun day at the bottom of the rocky stairs as they're known at least to me um, and they play a game of worst case scenario. Now when Deja brings up that her worst case scenario is Randall being too overprotective and her being locked up her, in her room for years, Randall surprises her saying that she's allowed to take the bus on one condition. She has to text him as soon as she gets to school every day, which Deja is excited about and we see just why she wants to take the bus to school, especially that route. It passes right by Malik's dad's body shop and we saw that on the bus ride, she ends up taking kind of a creeper photo of him and sends it to him and it actually does not scare him off. Instead, he laughs and is like, see you at school tomorrow. So um, it seems like that move worked for her. I don't think it's ever worked for me. 
Just kidding, I've never done that. As for Beth, she admits her worst case scenario is that she's projecting her own stuff on the girls and making them feel less than their unique selves. They all end up making up and have a blast and running up those rocky steps for a great last Pearson Family Fun Day. Now, over in California, we see Kevin is struggling with what he's supposed to be doing next in life. He's been sober now since Baby Jack was born and just finished working on a movie with M. Night Shyamalan. Now, Knight tells Kevin that when you strip away all the crap and Kevin going through the motions, it seems like Kevin's actually an incredible guy. So then we see Kevin in AA and he shares that, you know, he thinks he's way in over his head with everything. He's just been doing nothing but this routine of going to work and taking care of his ficus. And he really wants to help Kate and Toby with baby Jack, but he doesn't know what to do or say. He's also been worrying a lot about Nikki, who won't return any of his calls or texts. Rebecca tells Kevin he just needs to stop worrying and try to look for his next job to stay busy because it seems like that's helping Kevin most, at least from their perspective. Kevin, however, is leaning more towards staying home and helping with baby Jack. Now, Kevin ends up getting a call from his agent that he has an audition for a Spike Jones movie that takes place in Chicago and they want to meet with him the next day. Kevin then has a talk with baby Jack. You know, what's better than, you know, relaying all your problems with a baby who can't really tell you yes or no to anything. It's just a good bouncing board. Kevin ends up sharing with baby Jack how things are easier when he's on set. He just does what he has to, goes to the motions, but he does struggle when, you know, cut is called and then he's back to being himself. Kate ends up overhearing all of this thanks to a baby monitor and she reassures Kevin that he is a good guy. Kevin then says that he's not going to take this audition and he wants to stay and help. Kate then reiterates to Kevin that he should go because Jack needs Kevin at his best and it seems like Kevin is at his best and getting better, at least from their point of view when he's working. We then see Kevin on the way to the airport and we think that maybe he's going to Chicago for his audition, but instead He's brought his ficus and shows up on Nikki's doorstep and is ready to put his energy into helping his uncle. So we'll see if this is a good idea for him or not. As for Kate and Toby, they're both struggling with the news about baby Jack being blind and adjusting to that new life and they're hiding their issues with it in different ways. Kate pretends to be okay and steady while Toby doesn't really hide his worries for Jack but is more worried about Kate. He ends up revealing to Rebecca that while Kate acts like she's fine, she is turned to overeating again and he is really concerned for her. They then have a specialist come over to their new house to teach the family how to raise a blind child and safeguard the house. And when Kate starts talking about the TV they splurged for so Jack could start watching the Steelers games young, it finally sets in with her that baby Jack won't be able to do that and she has a breakdown. She ends up revealing to Kevin that she is having a tough time because she feels guilty. So many people, including the doctors and specialists, told her to not have a baby. She didn't listen, had this baby anyways, and now she feels like it's her fault that Jack is like this. Kevin gives her the pep talk she needs, and Kate goes back out to the family with a changed attitude, telling them that they've all been going about this the wrong way. All they've been doing is worrying, and baby Jack will eventually be able to pick up on that feeling and that atmosphere, and they need to change it immediately. Kate wants the feeling of this house to be hope and for Jack to live life without limits and everyone is in and we even hear Jack let out a little giggle and we know from the future storyline in the first episode back that Jack lives without limits, he has hope and he ends up becoming a superstar so it seems like they did something right and Kate adjusted pretty well. But, you know, the whole eating thing definitely seems like it'll continue to be a problem. Then we see Toby and the way he copes. Toby tells Kate that he's going late night grocery shopping because he likes to shop when the store's not busy. Turns out, though, he's actually going to the gym to work out. And we've seen various members of the family and friends telling Toby that it seems like he's losing weight, which he's covering up by saying it's due to stress. So while Kate is turning to a, a food addiction, could Toby be coping with a, a workout re uh, addiction because I feel like that is a thing, right? When people get so caught up in losing weight that they just keep working out, working out, working out and it, it, it can hurt their health as well. So yeah, everyone went through some sort of growing pain in this week's episode and that is of course going to continue throughout the season. So let's watch the promo for the next episode. Hi. Hey, I'm Mr. Lawrence. I know. I, and cool. Nice to meet you. This is my friend, Kevin. You are not at all what I pictured when your son said his mom was a vet. You're not at all what I picture when my son says he has a friend. You hear anything about me at school? Uh, holy crap. 
All right, so we do see that Kevin and Cassidy will cross paths, and it seems like the bond there is going to be Cassidy's young son. I'm guessing that Kevin ends up taking Nikki to meetings where Cassidy is also in those meetings and her son is probably waiting in daycare outside for her to get out. And uh, that will, of course, leave time for Kevin to bond with kid, the kid. And we know that he wants kids, so that could be the way to her heart. Although, will it actually turn into a love interest or not? Maybe it's just two people helping each other see their problems and work through them, and it just forms a strong friendship. I kind of think Kevin needs to take a step back from the love relationships for a while to work on himself, as we've seen he needs to do. So I'm kind of actually hoping more towards this being a really good friendship, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. In this trailer, we also see that other secrets will come out as Malik tries to figure out if Deja has heard that he's a father through the gossip grapevine, and Kate starts to wonder how Toby all of a sudden is getting a tone bod if all it seems like he's doing is late night grocery shopping. And, well, that pretty much wraps up my rambling for these two uh, first episodes of This Is Us Season 4. So far, it does feel like it's a bit of a slow start, but I'm already more interested um, in this season than I was in parts of Season 3. I was, like, kind of up and down with that season. But I am actually liking these new characters and that they've brought some new blood in and let us get to know these people without the Pearsons intact first. And then, you know get to see them through their own eyes and now we'll get to see them through the Pearson's eyes. And I'm excited for this season and it seems like there's already going to be lots of twists and turns so uh, you know what time it is. It's time for you to hit me up with your thoughts and theories and comments about these first two episodes uh, in the comments on my social media. Did you see that future twist with baby Jack coming? How do you think Malik and Cassidy will affect the Pearson's lives? Can Kevin help Uncle Nicky while also helping himself and uh, any theories about these future storylines, what happened to Kate, how she fits into it, let me know all your thoughts and theories. And after that, you know the drill. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of my future recaps. Check out more of my videos right over here. Um, as always, thanks for coming back, hanging out with me, listening to me ramble nonsense about TV shows and whatnot. And I hope to see you again real soon. Bye guys.